So my name's Pasha, um, and I run, I'm a co-founder of East London Productions, uh, which is a sort of transmedia um, TV and digital production company. Um, previous to that, I've spent sort of nearly nine years at Endemol um, running their digital strategy there. And um, obviously today's session is on crowdsourcing. And although it's not, crowdsourcing isn't inherently uh, digital, it of course does, um, it has, di the digital space and the internet has, has of course opened up many uh, extra accessible areas for crowdsourcing to happen, in including funding and in editorial sense as well with sites like YouTube and, and uh, Kickstarter and stuff like that. So there is a connection to um, it becoming more popular and more uh, in, in recent times. So we've got um, a, an eclectic mix, I think, of uh, panelists here who are going to present some of their um, stuff that they've been doing in this space um, from all different walks of life. Um, and also, we have someone back in London on Skype. Um, so I'll introduce everyone as we go along. It's, so in London, we have Franny Armstrong, who some of you may have heard of. She's the um, director and funder behind a, um, a global uh, climate change documentary that um, she, uh, is called The Age of Stupid. Um, and she sort of crowdsourced it for a number of different reasons, which you're going to find out about uh, in a sec. So we, we've got a video to show from, from her uh, as an interview in case the Skype sort of uh, doesn't work, as it often doesn't in these things. But she is on Skype as well, so we'll get a few questions from her as well. Um, and then next we have, um, we have Joe Twist here from uh, the Commissioning Editor of Education at Channel 4, um, previously also at the BBC. Um, and, and Joe has a couple of projects, one from the BBC and one from Channel 4, which really explore um, the sort of more creative and editorial um, sort of definitions behind crowdsourcing and, and an interesting look at to why a broadcaster has kind of uh, entered into this sphere, this space as well. And then we have Stefan um, Aquaroni, I want to say. He, does, he hates me to say that, but um, how can I not pronounce it like that? Um, he's going to pronounce his name correctly in a moment. Um, Stefan also, much like Franny, has, has sort of mobilized, um, I think his, his village, or a village certainly, um, to help fund a movie that is, is, he's now selling here at MIP, I think. So um, it would be interesting to hear some more about that. And then lastly, but by all means, not leastly, but Richard Lorber over the end, the CEO of Kino uh, Films, who releases over 20 films theatrically every year, I think, and has a huge catalogue of, of movie content. And I think Rich is going to give us a really good angle on how crowdsourcing um, affects or doesn't affect, indeed, um, the traditional film funding business. Um, and hopefully that will spark off a lot of debate and things. So I'm going to ask a few questions of these guys after they present, but we want to keep it really interactive, so get questions ready and stuff like that. And if you've got questions, we'll try and feed them in as and when, but we'll, we'll try and make sure we have at least 10 minutes at the end for that as well. So firstly, I think we're going to kick off with a video of an interview with Franny talking about the age of stupid um, and, and how and why she got it up and running. So I think if we cue that video, that would be great. Thanks. Hello, I'm Franny Armstrong, director of uh, The Age of Stupid, McLeibel and Drowned Out, and also the accidental founder of a campaign called Tentone, a climate change campaign, which came out of Age of Stupid. The Age of Stupid is a kind of documentary drama animation hybrid uh, set in the future in the year 2055 when the whole world is devastated by climate change. And uh, one guy there, played by Pete Possesway, uh, is looking back at old footage of us now and he's trying to work out why we didn't stop climate change when we had the chance. I wanted to get that funded in the traditional way, i.e. by TV broadcasters, and um, they all turned it down, cause, partly because they'd all had legal issues with McDonald's in the past, and partly because I was nobody, you know, I was a first-time filmmaker. And so with that film, I thought, I mean, I, just, I made that with the kind of maxing out credit cards, rich boyfriend funding model. Um, but then when I finished the film, I realised that actually if you pay for it yourself then you own the rights and that is the key thing in terms of distribution because if the BBC or whoever had paid for McLeibel they would have put it on the telly once, maybe twice and that would have been it, you know, a million viewers or something, that would be the end. But because I owned the rights then we could do the DVDs, the festivals, the cinema releases, or, you know, and uh, ended up with I think 20, 25 million viewers for McLeibel just off our own backs. So 
from that film, I understood that the key thing is owning your, your own rights. I'd never heard of crowdfunding when we came up with the idea in 2004 it was. We were just trying to think of a way that we could fund our film without giving away the rights, with us keeping editorial control. And, well, there was three things really. We wanted to keep the rights, we wanted editorial control, so we didn't have some, you know, lawyer or broadcaster, or, you know, executive telling us, you know, what film we had to make. And thirdly, you know, if there was any money made, we would like that money to go to the people who made the film and the people who believed it and stuff, you know, because, as I'm sure you know, there's been any number of hit documentaries in the past, but the way the funding uh, was initially given, that means all the, the, the uh, cash that comes in goes to distributors and middlemen and all the rest of it, and the people who kill themselves for five years making the film don't get anything. The basic plan with our, with our crowdfunding model is we were going to get a crowd of people to invest uh, chunks of money, and for that they get a percentage of the film, uh, and they get paid back their percentage once a year for 10 years. Uh, but also the crew uh, had to work at very, very low wages, essentially minimum wage, but to keep our costs down. But in return, they would also get uh, a cut of the film. And uh, so we're now two years later, and we've, we, so we've made our first two payments to our crew and our funders, which I have to tell you was so much fun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah you know, sharing out, getting the pie and sharing it all out. You know, some people were getting 80 quid. <laughs> yeah. and others were getting 8,000, 10,000, 15,000, you know, so some people were getting um, serious chunks of money and obviously it was based on, you know, how much time you put, from the crew point of view, how much time you put in, your level of the skills, you know, so the editor would be getting a lot of, a much higher percentage than, yeah. you know, the uh, person who was transcribing or whatever. You know. So we launched our crowdfunding in the room in Soho, December 2004 with basically our friends, 30 people, and we raised about 15,000 pounds that night. And then basically the word spread just through friends and friends of friends and friends of friends. And um, the first people who invested on that first night, they got a higher percentage for their money. Their money was worth more uh, than anybody else because at that point it was literally us standing in a room saying, you know, we've got this idea. It was quite naff. There's a making of documentary following the whole age of stupid and that event is there in the film. It's so bad, it's so chronic. Like the idea that anybody would give us money it was... Uh, anyway, but then, so then uh, as the years went by, just people came and more and more people came and then at some point, I can't remember where, we were a once we'd finished filming with Shell and stuff, <laughs> uh, then we were able to put it on the internet and uh, we'd got, we did some press articles about it and stuff and then we started getting strangers joining the, cr the crowd. Overall, we raised £450,000 to make the film and then almost exactly the same again, a bit less, to uh, promote the film. So £900,000 in all from about on the numbers, 350 people, something like that. <laughs> which leads on to what is the problem with crowdfunding, uh, which is admin. Right, okay. Yeah. <laughs> that is the problem with crowdfunding, because um, you can just imagine trying to make payments to all those people, you know, somebody's changed, somebody's moved, somebody's changed their bank account, somebody's split up with the person that they originally, you know, just like, I admin, admin, admin. But that is really the only drawback. Really, everything else about it is purely brilliant. And there were so many um, extra bonuses to it that we hadn't imagined until we got underway. For example, you know, everybody who was a crowdfunder and a crew um, was on our mailing list, you know, like an internal mailing list. And uh, we started realizing that anything we ever needed, somebody on that list would have it or know somebody who had it. For example, uh, we ran out of money and we wanted to record the orchestra we had a proper orchestral score written, but we didn't have enough money to hire a recording studio. So I wrote to the list, has anybody got a nice quiet room in London to record an orchestra? And got an email back, I've got a recording studio. <laughs> like one of our funders had a recording studio. So like things like that, just on everything. Then the next massive bonus with our, with our crowd is that you know we had about 300 investors and 100 crew. That's 400 people who all want this movie to really, really succeed, as in, that's a 400 strong PR team. You know, when normally a documentary is released, it has maybe one PR person or just the director. We had 400, you know, and really those, um, those 400 people, we did this, we, we launched the film with a big premiere across the whole country uh, from a solar powered cinema tent in Leicester Square linked by satellite to cinemas all around the country. And, and we had to fill those cinemas without any advertising money whatsoever. Um, and that's where our 400 people came in. You know, they were going around the cinemas, they were flyering, they were going to local schools, doing talks, saying this event is happening, you know, unbelievable. 
when I was making Age of Stupid, you know, it ended up taking about four or five years of my life, and I thought that was my contribution to climate change. That was quite a good contribution, you know. Um, but then as soon as we finished it, basically, we started screening it, and everybody was saying the same thing to us, which is, what can I do about climate change? And then it was like, oh, <laughs> you know. Uh, anyway, eventually we came up with this idea to set up this campaign called 1010, which is about cutting 10% of your emissions, which is actually an easy thing to do, particularly if you haven't started yet. <laughs> uh, you, as in an individual, a school, a business, the government, you know, whatever. And uh, we set that up a year and a half ago, and it took off like the proverbial battle of hell, and now it's running in 45 countries. And So at the moment, I've accidentally seemed to be running a campaign organisation, which is not something, a charity, you know. Yeah. Which is not something I uh, anticipated when I set off to make Age of Stupid, but that's the beauty of it, you know, if you set off to do these things and who knows where they might lead. Brilliant. Right, we should have, um, in the background, if we can switch to uh, the computer, we should have Franny there in her home in Camden, I think. Um, Franny, that's great, really inspiring story as well about how that... <laughs> how that worked. Um, and I think one of the really interesting things is obviously uh, quite poignant at the end where you sort of talk about where it leads. And I think there's, we're going to come on to some more of that actually, where it's not just about raising money. It's actually, um, there's a whole sort of deeper aspect in there. But I'm going to ask you a really boring question, first of all, which is um, to do with the legal side of it. And I know that because we talked a little bit about the contracting process. Um, can you just explain that a little bit? Yeah, well, when we first, hello, everybody. Uh, when we first came up with the idea, we went to see a lawyer, like film finance lawyer, and he said, it is the most original film financing scheme I've seen in 25 years, but it's illegal. <laughs> and <laughs> so then, um, but then he's, then he's, you can't do it, because it's, it's illegal because of this reason and that reason and blah, blah, blah. And so he helped us basically make it not illegal, which essentially meant getting um, clearance from this thing in the UK called the FSA, Financial Services Authority. But there's an equivalent in every country, and it's basically to stop people doing like pyramid selling and things like that. Anyway, so we had to go through the process of getting that legal approval, which cost about £1,500, if I remember it right. Um, but then once we've done it, then we've got these, uh, we drew up our legal contracts, and they're all like got official stamps, which is not illegal. And uh, we put those contracts on our website if anybody wants to take them and use them. Although I think yours wouldn't be legal without, you have to pay for the stamp again, depending on which country you're in, but if you care. And, and I've heard anybody um, getting into trouble for not having this official stamp. And your website is spannerfilms.net, isn't it, I think? Yeah. Yeah. So you can download her, the, her version of the contract, which is quite useful. That's I good. I paid twice. We've already uh, paid. No reason for you to pay as well. <laughs> <laughs> and just quickly before we move on, uh, I, something that, again, we're going to come back to a little bit later, but um, you know, is, do you think it's sustainable? Is the crowd, crowdfunding model sustainable? As I said in that video that I half, half heard, the problem is the admin. And so, you know, I mean, it would be, e be quite easy for us to do a crowdfunding now because we've already got all those people on, on one mailing list and we could say, okay, we're doing another film, who wants to, who wants to fund? And they, probably a lot of them would, you know. Um, but whether you could keep going film after film after film, I'm not sure. Pro mainly just from the point of view of the person organizing it. Like if somebody, if like one, you know, funding body said to me now, we'll give you a million quid, and you can keep your rights. <laughs> I'd probably, You'd take, probably that. take that option. <laughs> and presumably, because you also talked a little bit about the crew worked uh, not on full pay, essentially, so they worked yeah, in yeah. kind a lot of it. So, and that's clearly not necessarily sustainable either. No, at the moment, it, it takes some like obsessive like me, who doesn't mind working for five years on minimum wage, to pull off a project like that with that kind of funding structure, you know. So. Um, but there's a lot of people who can't do that because they've got, you know, dependents or whatever, whatever their personal circumstances are. So a lot of people do need to get paid. But then this is the, you know, that's the starving artist thing, isn't it? Depends how much you want to. Like, if you take, um, you know, broadcasting money or whatever, then you're going to give away your rights. So if you don't want to do that, if you want to keep your rights so you control your film, then something has to give, and often it's cash, <laughs> cash to you, you know. Brilliant. Well, look, we're, we're going to leave you there shortly, and we'll come back to you at the end. We'll have you up on the screen. Oh, my camera's at the audience, charming though you are to look at. I might, yeah, that's going to be difficult, actually. <laughs> Otherwise, I would definitely do that. And we're going to ask um, Dr. Joe Twist to um, come up and uh, talk about some of her projects, if that's all right. So we're going to leave you there, Franny, and move on um, to, I think, 
Do you know where your it's on the desktop? It's on the desktop. Brilliant. And it's in here. Yep. Off you go. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Oh, Franny's still uh, floating. You might be able to just yeah drag it somewhere. There we go. Hide, hide you down there, Franny. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, so, yes, uh, I am a commissioning editor for education at Channel 4. Um, I'm coming from this topic uh, slightly differently and from a slightly different angle. Um, we commission a lot of soft learning for UK teens aged 14 to 19. We target teenagers in their leisure time, not at school. We don't do curriculum-based learning. Uh, we do uh, life skills learning. So I'm going to talk to you about um, two separate stories. Um, and both of them are really crowdsourcing in some way, but neither of them are about crowdsourcing in terms of funding or finance. Um, they're about crowdsourcing and a different kind of investment, um, that of attention. Uh, but both of them are, uh, are about crowdsourcing loyalty to achieve some kind of value. I apologize if this is going to make some people seasick. It made me seasick uh, when I first saw this. So it's a prezi. Let me just check the time as well. So the first one is uh, something I commissioned at when I was at the BBC. I, I left the BBC about a year ago now. Um, and I was a BBC commissioner, multi-platform commissioner for entertainment and Switch, which is the BBC's youth brand. And um, we did this with uh, Hattrick, who came to us with this idea. They said, we've got these four awesome guys who are the top British YouTubers. They have huge audiences. Their names are Alex, Charlie is so cool like, uh, Johnny, and Jimmy. And they have massive teen girls who just love every word they post on uh, YouTube. Let's challenge them. Let's challenge them to do some crowdsourcing. Actually, sorry, I should have done this first. The second project I'm going to talk about is Battlefront, which is my Channel 4 education uh, project. So, Chart Jackers was four YouTubes, YouTubers. They had 10 weeks, no budget, to crowdsource a number one single from their fans uh, for children in need, which is um, the big uh, charity uh, uh, event that goes on to BBC every year to raise money for children in need charity. Um, it's had over 3 million views so far, all the videos. It was a totally social media project with five-minute TV uh, slots on BBC Switch a week. It had two, video, two exclusive video blogs from the lads and a heck of a lot of social media activity. And the aim was for them to really be the Pied Pipers for their fans and for their fans to create every single element that would, that would be required to produce a number one sig single and to get it to number one. So for example, um, they started off in their first week asking for lyrics and they used the mechanics of the web, uh, mostly YouTube, but Twitter and Facebook and their own <coughs> blogs um, to, to, to do the crowdsourcing for them. Hello, Jack, Jack Arenos. <laughs> Are we gonna call them that? <laughs> okay. I was thinking though, because like anyone who watches or gets involved at all, we could just call them chart jackers and we could all Yeah, we're all the chart Yeah, we're all the chart jackers. Don't worry, we're not the chart jackerinos. But you will be. It is the first week now of the project, and that means we need lyrics for the song. Because all you guys are so enthusiastic about getting the song put together, but we really want to jump on that and get it done as quickly as possible. So this week is going to be lyrics. So what we're going to try and do is write uh, an 80s slash 90s type of pop song, because we think that would be the most fun to do. The way that we thought we could write the lyrics, and this is a bit, a bit mad, a bit modern and a bit new, but bear with us. What you need you guys to do is in the comments of this video, just write one line, one like line of lyrics that we could use. Now we want the song to be as cheesy a love song as possible. Metaphors, is it? Metaphors, anything, anything you can think of. Uh, and then we thought the best way to compile a song is if any of you out there are budding songwriters, have a look through the comments, compile a song, and then email it to chartjackers at gmail.com and we'll pick the best one. Easy. And easy. And then we will have a song. Well, lyrics to a song. Yeah, good. People have been emailing us offering possibly every type of service we could ever need <laughs> yeah. with regards to this project, which is wonderful. Um, for those people that want to sort of help design things or form the band and stuff, 
we just ask you to just keep watching for now. We're not going to need you this week. There's not that many weeks that we have to do this, so pretty soon we're going to be calling on your services in whatever way we can. Thanks for watching. Uh, bye. 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 So they had actually at the moment it's standing at over four, nearly four and a half thousand uh, comments um, of lyrics. And in, in the first week when they asked, put out that call, they had well over a thousand um, comments back. It was one of the most commented pieces on YouTube that week. So as the weeks went on, they continued to do this. They had so many offers of help, it was unbelievable. People just wanted to do something good. And because they had grown up almost on YouTube with these four YouTubers and supported them from 2005, when YouTube first started, they really wanted to see them succeed. And eventually, they actually had a song. They had uh, someone give up a, a, a recording studio and produce a song for them. Unfortunately, it was banned by the Radio 1 playlist. And if you get onto the Radio 1 playlist, that's how you get to number one, because it's the biggest radio station almost in, in the UK. It was deemed as too cheesy, and for BBC Switch, this was a slight issue because BBC was banning a BBC song, but it wasn't really a BBC song. We were doing this as an observational document, uh, documentary, but it seemed a bit odd. So they decided, you know what? And this is when the fans started to realize that actually, um, you know, maybe they won't get to, to number one. And there began a little bit of a shift in attitude where they started to think, okay, well, actually, you know, we've got the power to make this go to number one. So they started protesting outside uh, Broadcasting House, and they started to go into meat space because that's where their audiences were and that's where they could make real change. They held a gig, as all good bands um, would do, uh, and they invited their audiences, their fans, the people who contributed to this, to the gig in London. That's them. They, they performed there along to the track that they played, and even Chesney Hawks turned up. There he is, and there he is, see, to the uh, left of Charlie. So they went, and they actually, you're getting, uh, you're getting communicated to. I hope it's nothing yeah. personal. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, towards the end of the 10 weeks, um, they uh, you know, started to get their fans to produce all the fan art for them. They produced posters. Their fans worked overtime to promote this single because all they needed to do was to buy it on iTunes to get it to number one. And here was the cover art. Sorry, it's a bit pixelated. Finally, the day came for it to be released. It was up against some really, t I can't remember now at the top of my head who it was up against, but some like Mariah Carey or someone like that. Um, the last ten weeks of my life. And here's the song. Of working with three of my friends from YouTube and the amazing YouTube community to try and create a charity single. The song is called I've Got Nothing, and the whole thing has been created with nothing but the goodwill of the people of the internet. The main aim of this project is to try and raise as much money for children in need as we possibly can. But the project's called Chart Jackers, and at the same time, we're trying to see if we can get this extremely cheesy pop song, completely different to anything that's in the charts at the moment, into the UK charts. This is the guy that made the music video. Um, it took him a week, so he hopes you'll like it. Here it is. I've got nothing. I'm not the best looking, I'm not the best dressed Hey, I don't know, I've got nothing Give me a chance, I'm better than the rest Hey girl, listen up, I've got nothing You know love ain't forever I've won the greatest prize And I feel it's now or never When I look into your eyes As well as playing, so obviously they got everyone on YouTube, all their fans and their followers, to post videos of them singing along and dancing along to the track. We also got Pudsy Bear, who is the big yellow bear, who's the, the, the icon of children in need to perform. And uh, those two people who were singing it, who recorded it, again, they were auditioned through YouTube, uh, and we actually brought them down. They, they got them down in a kind of X Factor style uh, audition. Because of time, I'm going to unfortunately cut that short, but you can watch it online. So it got to number 36 in the mainstream charts. It raised 10,000 pounds for children in need, and it got to number one in the independent uh, UK charts, and I think that's a massive win. But more importantly, um, the value that it gave to those involved and to the, the, the fans um, of the four YouTubers was incredible. Some of the comments like, the crazier and more exciting the task, the more it gives a greater cause for you to want to do more and more. 
worked my little tweeting networking ass off for this. I feel good to have made a difference. Check out my channel for a video of the Chart Jackers at BBC Switch Live today promoting the song in front of thousands of people. We need ordinary lies to enjoy the crazy things that happen sometimes. Looking forward to your normal videos. <laughs> this is the power of the internet used for a good cause. Spread the word, the Chart Jackers project. Um, so very quickly, the second one I want to talk about, and we can kind of go into questions, I guess, after this, but is the Channel for Education project called Battlefront, which is up for a digital Emmy tomorrow night. Fingers crossed, um, we will win. Um, this is our key flagship uh, campaigning um, sort of multi-platform program. Uh, it's online, it's TV, it's social media driven. It's 12 young campaigners on a mission to change the world. It runs over nine months of a year and it involves real world events and stunts as well. Here's one of them, Kaya in the middle, not the blonde one, that's Kimberly from Chrissy Cat Gut Dolls, uh, who was um, real beauty. Uh, this is uh, Kaya's campaign, they flash mobbed Westfield. Um, here's a short, actually I might just skip through that. Um, we tried to, this was a different kind of take on crowdsourcing because what this was about was crowdsourcing young people's passions to support a cause and that is very, very difficult to do, or is it? We tried various things and again, apologize, apologies for this being a bit pixelated, but on the website, the website is a hub for all the social media activity of each of the 12 campaigners on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter and on their own blogs. Um, we tried to do a bit of a gamification, which is now an evil word, um, on the site, so to get everyone involved uh, in setting up their own campaigns. So if you actually named your campaign, you leveled up to level two. If you actually um, put your campaign on Facebook, you leveled up. This didn't work. What did work um, was lots of competitions. And, you know, it's a really naff, cheesy way to actually get attention and to get support. Um, we had a 12th campaigner competition. We had a presenter search for the online um, fortnightly web show, uh, and we had um, a, a TV show that was filmed, and the filming of those TV shows for T4 actually produced the biggest spikes. Um, this is an example. So this is uh, Malam, who we found online, um, and he, again, was a, was a top YouTuber who already came with a massive audience, and it was his crowdsourcing of support that got him the, the presenter gig. Thank you so much, guys. I won the presenter search for Channel 4's Battlefront show. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. I am so excited to be presenting it, and I couldn't have done it without you guys, because I know a ton of you voted, and thank you so much. So basically, the show's about young people campaigning, getting their voice heard, spreading positivity, and I am so excited to be part of that. So definitely check it out. In fact, the Christmas special is up now, so if you click the box, you can check out the Christmas special episode. Also, if you're interested in music, there's a competition at the moment called the Battlefront Anthem. So he mentioned something that's quite key, which is um, thank you. And one of the things that we found in uh, uh, these two projects, and it's probably a no-brainer to think of this, um, but it's the value and the transactional relationship and um, what is it that people are getting out of being involved in these two kinds of projects. And, you know, to us, crowdsourcing is a bit like designing a bit of a game of value. Um, this is a quote, quite a long quote, from Frank Rose, from his, uh, who was interviewed by Henry Jenkins about his new book. If we get rewarded all the time, because reward is key to all of these um, crowdsourcing <laughs> ideas, the dopamine release goes down and we begin to lose interest. If we never get a reward for what we're doing, we get frustrated and lose interest even faster. The most effective reward pattern, it turns out, is one that has a certain amount of randomness built into it. Slot machine operators have known us for decades, but it was a neuroscientist at Washington State uh, named Jacques Pensip who connected it to behavior he calls seeking. Seeking or foraging is one of the most basic survival instincts in the animal world. And in Chart Jackers and Battlefront, we saw this happen. We saw where the randomness and jeopardy of being involved um, really worked for these projects. Um, but there are also examples of where young people themselves were galvanized um, as crowds to create value for themselves. And the payback was about recognition, was about credit, um, but it had to be a, a, a two-way street. There had to be a social contract where um, they were getting involved in something that they felt was worthy. In the case of Chart Jackers, it was about doing something good, raising money for charity, and supporting the people that they loved and felt passionate about. And in the case of Battlefront, it was very much about feeling connected to something much bigger than them. 
and something meaningful via campaigners. You know, and ultimately, being involved meant that they, the accountability was with them. Uh, the success or failure of these projects was down to them. And they created value in very, through very unique architectures of participation, i.e. the web. And it showed them that they have the power and they can be the agents of change. And once they invest their intention, attention into a project, they had a stake and it, it was up to them uh, to make it a success. We're about to embark on a new crowdsourcing project, um, which I can't talk about because we haven't signed the contract yet, um, but it's going to be uh, even bigger and even more awesome than those two projects. Um, sorry, I probably ran completely over time. Apologies. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's great. Um, I want to just ask you one quick question so mm. we can swiftly move on with uh, Stefan's project. But we're seeing some patterns arise here in terms of um, the necessity for leaders in the crowdsource sense. You know, so it's all about you know, usually one or, or a couple of individuals really sort of being passionate about a project. And um, that was quite clear, obviously, with Chart Jackers and, and both Battlefront as well. But what's the, as a commissioner, you've got a budget, so you're not looking for funding through crowdsourcing as such. So what's the, the attraction as a broadcaster? Um, what are you looking for out of it? Well, you know, we, we, we suffer in this industry of not having a diverse enough um, representation of opinions, perspectives, and activities, and, and, and people involved in media that is created for us. So actually, one of the benefits is um, by tapping into a huge user base or fan base or crowd, you're bound to get diversity. And diversity of opinion and representation of that diversity is absolutely key. So you're getting different perspectives, and you're getting challenged in different ways. And that's, what, that, that's one big benefit, I think. And presumably, there's also the promotional aspect, which Franny mentioned as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Suddenly, you've got a crowd of people who are all your ambassadors for the project. So uh, absolutely. your audience I, is kind of there from the start. And that was what was interesting about Chart Jackers, was initially, they started saying, this cheesy 80s pop song isn't the kind of song that's going to make it to number one. And that was evidenced by Radio 1 banning it from their playlist. But actually, it was like a kind of, yeah, yeah, look, it's actually it yeah. your, within your power. You know, yeah. all you need to do is to tell 10 people to go and buy the track on iTunes, and you have the power. And it was a media literacy lesson, if anything, for them. Fantastic. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Stefan, if you'd like to uh, take to the lectern. <laughs> Thanks. OK, so I'm, my name's Steph Akron. I'm a producer from Birmingham in the UK. And I'm going to tell you uh, a very short story about Tortoise in Love. Um, it's a romantic comedy, not a documentary. It used crowdsourcing, although I had no idea that's what we were doing at the time, both to fund it and to make it. And it did it in a way that didn't involve paying crew next to nothing. We actually paid our cast and crew union, if not above union rates. So I'm going to do a couple of things in the next sort of uh, seven or eight minutes. I'm going to show you the trailer in a, in a few minutes. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about some of the mechanics around it because Fanny mentioned the legal side of things and uh, there's a few tips that I've got uh, to share to do with the financial structures and some of the, the models and mechanisms we use that might be useful. Um, but first, I just want to tell you a bit about how it came about. Um, and that really starts in Birmingham Airport uh, in January 2008 where I was snowed in uh, 26 hours waiting for the French to clear the runway at Charles de Gaulle Airport. Um, and during this time, Guy Browning, who is the writer and director of the film and was my business partner in a couple of other not completely unrelated businesses already, uh, he's an international writer and public speaker and, and business guru, humorist writer. Um, he phoned me up while I was in Birmingham Airport and he said, Steph, I, I want to make a film. And I thought, oh, damn, I knew there was a reason he got involved with this business in the first place, and I've now realized what it is. And he said, don't worry, um, I've written a script already. I wrote it over Christmas, which immediately made me oh, terrified. And he said, and it, it's completely executable within my village. Um, so we don't need to spend money on locations or props or anything like that. Um, and his village is the village of Kingston Bagpews in Oxfordshire, home to this hair salon amongst other things. And this is Ivan Kay, who you may recognize from Lair Cake, um, having his hair done in the village salon in Kingston Bagpews on Southmore in Oxfordshire. A village of around 2,000 people, um, big cross-section of society, of demographics, um, and 
basically very shortly after this conversation with Guy, I found myself in a village meeting in a space roughly the size of this in Kingston Bagpew's village hall, talking to around 300 villagers. Um, and Guy had said to me before, well, we're really, really keen. We've had a meeting already. They're really enthusiastic about it. And they want to make this film with us. Um, you're going to come and tell us how we're going to do it. And I stood in front of these people whose life experiences were inestimably vast and huge, but whose experience of film was virtually nothing. I think someone there had made a film once, but that was about it. And they obviously made the documentary that, 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 that covered this uh, whole project. And very quickly, what happened between that meeting and the production wrap only five months later is that we equipped a village of people in England with the skills and resources to make Tortoise in Love. And when I say we equipped them with the skills and resources to make a film, they didn't write it, Guy wrote it, they didn't act in it except in some bit parts, and they didn't do the camera stuff. That was all done by completely professionally paid uh, crew and, uh, and cast. But they did do the hair and makeup in the salon. Um, the Women's Institute did the catering. And you can imagine what that's like as a lady, possibly, who may or may not lunch, um, in the Women's Institute in Oxfordshire, uh, doing uh, 100 meals three times a day for six weeks. And they were absolutely immense. If I ever wanted to get anything done ever in the future, I'd ask the WI. They were absolutely extraordinary. And of course, we now have a network of people to help us do what we're doing now, which is marketing the film. Um, this is Dougie Ovenden. He was uh, an engineer and became our props master, made a large number of the props in the film. Um, this is Leslie Staples, who was one of the calendar girls in the calendar girls movie with Pat Dando. Um, Pat put me and Leslie up in her home, as did around 40 other villagers, put people up in their homes for the, for the duration. And um, her, her husband had just retired from a board position in a multi-billion pound company, and he became our village orchestrator. He was in charge of making everything happen in the village. So this wonderful, eclectic bunch of people made a movie, and I'm going to uh, show you the trailer, if that's OK now, very quickly. Hello, stranger! Oh. Tom Cullen! I knew you'd be back. What's a big city got to offer that we haven't? Hot women, I'll bet. <laughs> I bet you didn't get one, though. What's that beautiful music? It's Anya. She's my new pair. So you found yourself a man yet? No. Don't worry, we'll find you a nice Englishman. All the good ones are taken. Doesn't mean you can't try them. Hello, Tom. Uh, would you like a cup of tea? Once in a while, a man will fall in love. Are you OK? I think so. Tom's in love with Vanya! Very, very slowly. You're in there, mate. Don't move too fast, though. Give it another year or two. He's got it bad, hasn't he? Talk to plants, but you can't talk to women. You get a lot more sense out of plants. Why can't you just kiss her? Because you can't just kiss people. There's a lot more to it than that. Like what? Preamble, background checks, that type of thing. You can't just kiss. Maybe he uh, plays hard to get. No, men don't play hard to get. Because we all know they're not hard to get. What you've got to remember is that all is fair in love and war. That's because love and war are very similar. That's when he needs a little help. What do women really want? Oh. Shoes. 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 <laughs> Have you had your hair done? Yes. Do you like it? Yeah. Makes your shoes look bigger. But when a whole village comes together, things can speed up. What are you doing in here? And miracles can happen. Good for landing. I cannot describe how wonderful this experience was because everything about a normal film set, which I had some experience of, was totally the opposite. If I say can-do attitude in a kind of management bullshit way, which is my professional background, you don't believe what this means until you see somebody source the red arrows um, for you to fly over your village for a film. So this was incredible. So Guy really had not been lying when he said he'd found a village to help make the film. But crucially, they also helped to fund the film. Um, so uh, we, we did a lot of technical stuff to try and make our film investable in. 
And Franny talked about the difficulty around the Financial Services Authority and the way they regulate share offerings. Um, we, uh, we, we did this. Uh, we did it without having to get Financial Services Authority approval. And just very quickly, in the last couple of minutes, I'm going to tell you how. So we had a limited company, which in the UK uh, is a very easy thing to set up. Uh, we treated it as a single purpose vehicle for this film. And we paid um, a lawyer uh, a couple of thousand pounds, just actually less than that, to write a new set of company documents, uh, our new articles of association. Um, and we used a non-film lawyer, which is really interesting, because he was able to cut to the chase of what we wanted to do. He wasn't surrounded by ideas of how film finance worked. He just knew how business worked, and he knew what we wanted to do. We wanted to set up a private company and sell shares in that company, and we didn't want to have anything to do with dollar paths or first returns or anything like that. So what we did, we set up um, Immense Productions. We set up a charity called the KBS Trust, and we gave the charity a golden share in the film. The charity was set up to benefit the village. So the village had an indirect stake for all of the work they were doing. And then we authorized um, 8,300 different type of shares so that the villagers could also buy a stake in the film. So we issued these B shares to investors. They were non-voting B shares, so as a, a board, we can arrange ourselves and, and we can decide when we think we've banked, hopefully, all the money from the sale of the film and, and issue dividends to these investors. Um, and it was as simple as that. The money will come in and it will get distributed out amongst the shareholders. Um, and we did this also within the UK uh, tax structure. So it was an EIS scheme. So these investors got tax relief on their investment and on uh, future proceeds. We also got the cultural certificate from the UK Film Council and uh, obtained a 20% tax credit for the film, uh, which was very useful in paying for post-production. Um, and we have a mixture of investors, uh, mixed it, ranging between people who put in, one guy put in multiple tens of thousands of pounds, through to villagers who just wanted to buy a little steak, and they put in 20 quid. This is how we did it. Um, it cost very, very little. Company formation cost 20 quid. I said we paid about 2,000 pounds to the solicitor to set up our articles. These other things cost 40p each because that was the price of a stamp, and that's all we had to do. So getting the EIS certificate, issuing the tax forms, um, doing the UKFC cultural certification all cost virtually nothing. And because my background was in management and business, actually I was able to do all this stuff without paying an accountant or a lawyer to do it. So if you're in business and you're trying to get into film or if you're in film and you want to make a film, um, get someone who knows business and you'll save a huge amount of money on this sort of stuff. Um, and then we had to find the shareholders and this was the last bit. We were a private company so we couldn't market the share offer. We had to introduce the opportunity to people and then tell them they could invest if they took a conversation with us. So we used direct mail um, to inform a targeted list of high net worth individuals about the existence of a business plan, which is a piece of legal rhetoric um, that I've so far got away with. Uh, we use social networks like LinkedIn and Facebook to reach out beyond our immediate friends and family to offer them the opportunity to invest. Uh, we did have a website for locals, uh, but of course websites can be accessed by anybody, right? So people from outside were able to find out about it and invest. Um, and of course the most powerful catalyst was the village newsletter, and that's what brought the most amount of money in. And that was the total budget. Um, most of it came through the sale of these B shares. Uh, we got a little bit of funding from a rural projects fund, money from the tax credit. You always end up putting a bit of your own money in. Um, and we got £5,000 for sponsorship from a couple of brands in the area. Um, so that's the total budget. But as you can imagine, the value of what was contributed by the village was enormous. And this, um, in total, was, was absolutely overwhelming and much, much more than the cash contribution. So that's a very potted introduction to Tortoise in Love and some of the mechanics. Um, it is for sale at the moment. Maura is here from 7 and 7. So if any of you are buyers and you think you want to watch a screener, she'll be around. Um, but I'm very, very delighted to, to talk to anyone who wants to find out more about the mechanics as well. Fantastic. Brilliant. <laughs> Th thanks a lot for uh, yeah, going into quite heavy detail on the finance. Sorry. That, no, 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 it's good. I think uh, hopefully that's really useful for everyone here. And certainly I think it, it opens up the kind of question, how easy is it to get into? Just um, quickly before we move on to uh, Richard here, I wanted to ask, so basically um, wh what happens now? I mean, obviously you're selling the, sh the film here, but what happens after that? You know, it, like does, does the, um, I mean, 
presumably the village turns uh, into a studio now. Gu gu Guy's an ad man, um, and he made a promise to the village that uh, at some stage in the future, I think he's given us a few years still, 10 Tappins coaches, 10 Tappins coaches being the Oxfordshire-based coach company, would line the main street in the village to take the villages to the premiere in Leicester Square. So this is now what Moore and I have to do in the next few weeks. Fantastic. And I'm sure the lady who owned the stately home, which was a key linchpin of the plot, um, will benefit if it does successfully, does well yeah. from uh, a few more visitors to her, her home as well. So. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And lastly, uh, Richard, if you could uh, take to the stage and uh, talk about a little bit about the kind of the traditional m methods and, and how sort of crowdfunding might, might fit into that. Hi, hello, um, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, before I start, I'm just curious who all of you are. Um, could you raise your hand if you're producers or filmmakers? I just want to get a sense. Oh, that's, that's good. Um, and would you also raise your hand if you're in the industry on the commissioning side or in programming uh, development? Okay, so good. And the others of you are other? How many are other? Okay, well that's often the most interesting category. We'll come to that later. Uh, I, um, I am the CEO of a company called Kino Lorber that was formed uh, about a year ago through um, acquisition of a company that's been around for 30 years called Kino started by a friend of mine, we went to college together, uh, and I've had <coughs> companies called Fox Lorber and such over the years, um, and we basically acquired the company and combined resources, and now we have a company that has about 25 people based in New York. We're, I guess we are the leading, or the, 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 arguably the biggest of the little guys in terms of companies that do art house and documentary distribution the old-fashioned way in the sense of releasing films to movie theaters, selling little plastic discs that used to be called DVDs, now they're sometimes called Blu-rays, and we're very engaged in all things digital with output deals with Netflix and uh, YouTube and Amazon and many, many more, and dealing with the alphabet soup of SVOD, NVOD, AVOD, and all that stuff, running very fast, as fast as we can, to outrun the decline in the DVD, traditional DVD business, and the softening of the theatrical market. We, um, in the US, release um, about 25, 20, 24 films the, in, in theaters, both on 35, with 35 millimeter prints and HD and uh, various other digital formats, and about 60 of our titles per year on DVD and in various digital formats. Of all of the titles we release, about a third are docs, and docs are probably the fastest growing part of our business. Um, just as more background, these are some of the uh, features, that, doc features that we have released this year in current release. Um, award winners, festival circuit darlings, films that uh, are uh, sought after by cinephiles as well as, as uh, passionate interest groups. And I'll, I'll come to that in a second. Some of these may be familiar to you, uh, but the reality with documentary features in the US is that it's, it's always a tough slog. Most of these films perform theatrical uh, with a box office, not in, counted in the millions, but counted, if you're lucky, in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. OK, well, this is the big question. Why am I here? Well, what do you think? Big money? Uh, no, but I think, you know, I, I did get a ride from the airport, so that was good. Uh, have any of you been to the after parties? Well, I haven't been invited to those yet. But uh, realistically, um, what, what has compelled me to take this crowdfunding and as an extension of crowdsourcing very seriously is the interaction that we've been having over the past two or three years with more and more of our filmmakers who are waving the, uh, the rebellious banner of, of do-it-yourself producing, do-it-yourself distribution, and do-it-yourself funding. Uh, the DIY model has become a, a major crusade cause in the US, and I think widely around the world. But in the US, uh, there are fewer opportunities for funding. There are no uh, subventions. There are no subsidies. There are tax schemes in various states. But it's basically uh, you know, a raise the money yourself game. And <clears throat> as we all know, the internet does change everything. And there are new paths to market for independent filmmakers who are finding tools and techniques through uh, 
internet and social media that allow them to bring their films both as a development project and as a completed work to new audiences and to connect with their audiences on a direct path. So we've been paying close attention as a traditional commercial distributor to see what we can learn and to avoid being effectively disintermediated by all these do-it-yourselfers. So realistically, we look at the do-it-yourself model, sometimes uh, DIY as what we call in the US is DWI. Many uh, independent filmmakers are so intoxicated with the do-it-yourself idea that they're just driving wildly into walls. Uh, they are getting their projects a quarter funded, half funded. They're spending two, three, five years of their lives, as Franny indicated. Often they get sucked into a situation in a do-it-yourself mode without realizing that they're going to be basically postponing most everything else that they wanted to do and find their role in life to becoming more what I'm doing, which is a distribution company. Uh, we have taken a different approach and we try to position ourselves as a hybrid distributor with a DIT model where we want to effectively leverage the huge resources and ingenuity and entrepreneurship of these independent filmmakers with the skills and talents and company resources that we have as a commercial distributor. We have the kinds of output deals. We have our own sales team. We have the art department. We have the resources that can help the independent filmmakers accomplish more in a multiple, with a multiplier value by working with us in a kind of a collaborative spirit. So crowdfunding has become more and more on, to, to become more on our radar in that we see filmmakers coming to us with projects either half funded or completely funded with also funding available to support distribution. And I'll come to that in a second. What's, and the, and the landscape of independent film production, particularly documentaries, it's no surprise that more and more films are being made, but actually fewer and fewer are being seen. What we see on television in the US, as you're seeing around the world and as we'll see at MIP, of course, our reality series and every imaginable uh, variation on what I consider to be some you know, fairly cheesy, sleazy themes. But that's the way of the world. And the filmmakers who are making high quality independent documentaries, which they're able to do because of inexpensive digital equipment and the ability to recruit friends and family, are finding that they have a finished film. They can edit it in their, in their basically in their, in their rec room on their own laptops and have something that can be presented but cannot find a way to have it seen by audiences. What crowdfunding does, by raising the money to make the film, it opens the door to building audiences even before the film is made. Unlike the examples that have been discussed here for the most part, uh, or two of the three examples that were discussed here, in the US, crowdfunding at the moment is not an investment-based business. It's micro-patronage. Um, what that means is the contributions from the tens and hundreds and thousands of people who will contribute as little as a dollar to a project is not an investment stake. Even if they contribute a thousand or ten thousand dollars, it's pure grant and there's no return expected except possibly an incentive, a gift, an opportunity to meet with a filmmaker, and a whole range of various rewards which are important, but they're not financial rewards in the sense of taking an investment stake in the film. There are three key platforms, internet-based platforms, that have been established in the US, and they operate, I think, internationally uh, in the past two or three years. The biggest one is Kickstarter, and you can go online and find kickstarter.com, and they'll explain what it is to you. Kickstarter is a platform to attract independent projects from filmmakers. This can be the uh, funding for the development of a film, for the production of a film, for post-production, for cost of rights, for distribution support, anything you want it to be. And it doesn't only have to be about film. There are all kinds of funding projects that are being presented in the arts, in social mission issues, and various other enterprises. Kickstarter started, as I mentioned, about two years ago. To date, the, uh, overall, it has raised over $30 million across 15,000 projects. 
the model for Kickstarter is that if you, you, you set a goal for the project that you have, whether it's $5,000 or $500,000, if you meet the goal, you get the money. If you don't meet the goal, you get zero. It's an all or nothing game and it's a big bet. Some film, and you set a number of days or a period of time to get that point. And many, many filmmakers like the pressure of having to make it work or they, they lose it all. Uh, another company smaller than Kickstarter started about the same time, maybe a little earlier, is Indiegogo, which has a slightly different model. You keep whatever you raise. Both of these companies charge fees in the 4 to 5 percent range. There are some additional fees for processing of the, cr the credit card contributions. With Indiegogo, if you don't meet your goal, you get to keep your money, but you pay a higher percentage back to the organization. The third company, which is the most recent and the smallest, Rocket Hub, is really more of a, a, a cultural mission. They have a belief in, in the revolutionary aspect of crowdfunding and are trying to motivate more and more people to get involved. Uh, but they are, at the, as, as of now, they've been the least uh, established and least used of any of these companies. Uh, we've had several dealings with uh, filmmakers who've gone through various aspects of crowdfunding. Uh, I'll give a few examples here. Uh, <clears throat> Jennifer Fox is a pre-established uh, American documentary filmmaker. Her film, Con Flying Confessions of a Free Woman, was sold all over the world. It was released theatrically in the U.S., sold on television and such. Her new project is about uh, something that's been a passion of hers for over 10 years. Uh, her documentary about her Tibetan spiritual teacher, a very important Rinpoche in Tibet. And she tracks him and his life and his family and such. <clears throat> so far, she set a goal of $50,000 to be used for clearance of rights and for production for, and for distribution support. To date, she has raised about $35,000 and she has 55 days to go. So we're waiting and watching to see how she does. The Banjo Project is a fascinating uh, project which we're hoping to acquire for uh, some set of rights which looks at the, the instrument, musical instrument of the banjo in American culture and how this instrument was, was often scorned and was ridiculed but really had its, its seeds as part, it was, was seeding the evolution of a very authentic American folk tradition which is not widely known. It's very surprising how many people actually love banjo music and how many closet banjo players there are, the most famous of which is the comedian Steve Martin and he's been very involved in this project. They set a goal of $25,000 and in, I think, three weeks they raised almost double that. Again, through the process that these, the Kickstarter site and others like it allow them to reach out, social media, send emails, friendly e-blasts to friends and family, and gather a constituency focused on this particular kind of content. The third uh, title is a documentary about a peculiar phenomenon that is asexuality, about people who have no sexual per persuasion or no sexual interest. Uh, they're not homosexual, they're not bisexual, they're just asexual. Uh, the documentary is being <coughs> developed by Angela Tucker. She's actually completed shooting and she had a modest goal of $10,000 to pay for editing post-production. She, she has raised $11,000 and now she will launch a new crowdfunding campaign to help support the distribution process of the film now that it's nearing completion. What's interesting in looking at the crowdfunding phenomenon in terms of docs is that docs are really made for crowdfunding. They are very successful crowdfund projects because they're constituency focused. They bring together people who have similar interests. Docs that have an activist or an advocacy thread where people want to be part of it, they're voting in effect with their financial commitment, a cause is very compelling. And they have a personal, passionate, personal tale to tell. Those are the kinds of things that have been most successful in this doc crowdfunding landscape. The actual process of crowdfunding works a lot like a documentary. The, the engagement that the people who are undertaking crowdfunding involves telling their personal story, why they're involved, and what they care most deeply about. They're collaborating around a particular purpose, which is the subject of the film. And the process itself, in, in raising the money, is almost as much of a mission as getting the film made. We have learned from these tools and techniques and have 
basically launched filmmakerdirect.com. If you go online, you won't find anything on the site yet. We own the URL, but we haven't populated it yet. We're developing a business model that will provide a set of tools to allow us as a hybrid distributor to work more convincingly with filmmakers who can be, find the kinds of tools they need to advance their own do-it-yourself ethic with partnering, partnering with us as, as a, a do-it-together distributor. And finally, we have acquired the URL of crowdfund match, which is one way that we can actively leverage the crowdfunding success that filmmakers have by agreeing to provide funding to, pro, to give actual cash that is applied to marketing and distribution for projects that get crowdfunded, we give the filmmakers an incentive to tell their potential funders that any money they contribute will be supported and money will be provided in same amounts by a fairly well-known commercial distributor who will get that film seen. And that's the most important thing right now, we think, in this surfeit of more films being made than can ever be seen. We have to find ways to direct more of the crowdfunding resources into audience building and having these important, passionate works of, which involve great sacrifice and great effort on the part of filmmakers, help them find their audiences. And crowdfunding seems to be an interesting path to that. So there you go. Thank you very much. That's great. We've just, um, that's brilliant. Thanks, Richard. We just out of time actually so we won't be able to take any questions but I'm sure these guys will hang around for a few minutes if you've got any sort of detailed questions around that um, I'm just gonna wrap it up slightly um, with a kind of a summary I think of, of what we've seen here and it certainly it seems like um, one of the key things to getting a crowdsourced or crowdfunded project up and running is is passion and being an ambassador or finding an ambassador for your project um, and reaching out to people it sounds like it's a lot of hard work um, you don't get paid very much um, and it can take a long time. So I think as most of you are producers, um, you probably already know that because that's what you have to do anyway. So uh, I guess there's, there's nothing really left to be said apart from get out there and, and do some of that. It's worth doing. It's worth doing. And, and the payoff exactly is that that's why we're all in this business. So um, um, get out there and do it, I think. Brilliant. Thank you very much to our panelists here. Thank you for you guys. Cheers. Great. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you. Thank you.